so before I can introduce our guest for tonight, Jean Kempf, I just wanted to give you an idea, an overview of the rest of the evening. So we will start with Jean's talk. Uh, then there will be a screening of all the Scene Festival student winners here in this room as well. And then we'll end with drinks up in the gallery where you can also watch the show, Learning the Minds, that has a student award from <coughs> our different partner schools. So a, a long and interesting evening ahead of us. Jean, thank you very much for joining us today. Jean Kempf is a professor of American Studies at the University of Lumière Lyon. He has written extensively on American photography and on American cultural history. His research concerns American photography both from, both, sorry, from a visual studies and a sociological perspective. He also writes about various aspects of US cultural history. His recent publications include Les Mots des Etats-Unis, Mot M-O-T-S, even though I guess it could be M-A-U-X, um, Une Histoire Culturelle des Etats-Unis, and with François Brunet and other colleagues, L'Amérique des Images. He is the former director of the Lyon University Press and a CNRS research professor in New York. And we're very happy to have you tonight and look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me and thanks for showing up. <laughs> um, if you don't mind, uh, I think I'll spend most of the talk sitting on my chair, just like you are. Um, um, that, that'll be probably easier for me, uh, also because I, I, I need some notes here. Um, although what I intend to talk about today is, is part of uh, uh, my current research, and uh, it's more like a series of questions that I would like to put to you. Um, it, it's going to be a little depressing. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, d depressing not because I'm going to show you images which are depressing, I'm not going to show many images, uh, but because uh, I would like to start with a fairly negative or pessimistic view of what the documentary and documentary photography is. Hopefully, towards the end, um, it's going to get better. Um, I've decided to finish on a more upbeat note. Um, why the documentary? And the, the subtitle which I chose was some thoughts, so it's going to be open to also questions, I, I hope, uh, about something which is a complex photographic practice. It's a practice. Uh, documentary is a practice. It's not necessarily a style. I don't really agree with uh, the, the concept of documentary style, which may remind you of a book, a very famous book, written by a very famous uh, Swiss colleague. Um, but it's, it's mostly a practice, and it's complex in the, I think, proper sense of the term. It's complex in the sense that it's not complicated, but it's, it's very um, involved and... and uh, it's difficult to understand. Um, and and so, so the question is not easy, and, and it's uh, uh, rather contentious, I think. Um, put it simply, and the question that I would like to ask you, us, is, is anyone really looking at documentary photographs? Or, if you prefer, is there an audience for documentary photography? Um, the question is probably part of a much broader one, a uh, much more radical one, uh, which I I'm sure you're very well aware of. Is anyone actually looking? Um, well, I won't get into that because that would take us too far. And yet, the question must be asked, and especially in front of an audience who, uh, which is particularly interested in, in um, communication. Is anyone looking at documentary photography? Is there an audience for documentary photography? Um, the fact is there, uh, there have never been more documentary projects produced 
accessible, visible than today. There's an inflation of documentary projects. But the question is also that just as with publishing, publishing as you may know, and publishing, this is why I mentioned that I was the director of a, 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 a press, uh, publishing is one of those very strange economic activities where the, the, the less you sell, the more you produce. You don't sell very many books, but you produce more and more books. And there seems to be uh, this kind of conundrum, this kind of paradox in documentary uh, photography, uh, which means that we should dissociate uh, economics from semiotics in this particular instance. There are reasons for this documentary inflation which lie beyond the economic and even the technical explanation. I'm also raising this question as uh, a sort of healthy paradox, I hope. Uh, and in the posterity of a now almost ancient book, very famous book that you all know, which is um, Susan Sontag's On Photography, you may remember that Sontag's musing about photographs were not too kind for photography. She saw it as the hidden manifestation of a form of disengagement of the self in post-capitalistic societies. She saw photographs and photography as a medium leading to a form of absence from the world, in a sense, uh, while pretending to be just the opposite. And despite the shortcomings, uh, uh, the many shortcomings of, of this book on photography, uh, shortcomings that she herself uh, uh, put forth in, in, in her uh, later uh, publications, uh, Sontag's arguments, I think, are still extremely valid, and all the more so in digital societies. In any case, uh, when you love something, as I do, as I love photography, you should not try to defend it, but on the contrary, you should uh, try to probe it ceaselessly to expose its weaknesses, uh, the modern term being stress tested. So my pessimistic take on documentary uh, photography uh, also owes a lot to uh, early forms of cultural criticism, those of Benjamin uh, Walter Benjamin and, and, and Brecht, especially when uh, Brecht, and you all know this remark, uh, remarked that a photograph of something never explained the true nature of the subject photographed. Um, and uh, I think this, this remark is, is absolutely central and will lead to uh, hopefully the understanding of certain forms of contemporary uh, documentary. So uh, please bear with me tonight as I raise each point in the form of a hypothesis, a series of hypotheses, based on some detailed observation, observations, but certainly not intended as the final word on the topic, hence my title. Um, and we can discuss those propositions uh, um, afterwards. So what, what are we First point that I would like to raise is what are we talking about when we talk about documentary uh, photography? Uh, documentary photography or documentary photographs is a phrase which is way too vague, but which has become inescapable because of its widespread use, so we'll keep it, and hopefully we'll try to keep it simple. For my purpose tonight, it will be enough to, and I have a sophisticated system here of uh, what the documentary, uh, first of all, speak about what the documentary uh, uh, is not. And the do what the documentary is not is uh, uh, perhaps uh, we could take this as um, hot news, raw impact, famous photograph of uh, Eddie Adams taken in the Originally, I wanted to show you this and, and the movie, which the, the moving images, the, the, 
the stills and the movie images. It was a bit too complicated to show you how uh, um, um, to stress the, the importance of photographs, of, of still photographs in, in, in visual shock. But this is not documentary. Uh, documentary is more um, defined, and, and once again, I'm only showing one image, but this is a, a complete nonsense to show just one image because uh, precisely um, uh, documentary is not one image, but I uh, just quote here uh, uh, something which to me is the typical example of the, uh, of the documentary project, which is the long-term, very long-term uh, documentary project, Darcy Padilla, the Julie project. Uh, some of you may know it. Uh, it's uh, Darcy Padilla is a California-based uh, uh, photographer who met this woman. This is the beginning uh, of, of their relationship. Met this woman uh, when she was just out of uh, rehab and followed her throughout her life uh, when she had kids, a family, and eventually died of AIDS very long period of time. I think it's about 12 years. So it's, it's an extremely involved and, and complex thing. So what is documentary photography? Uh, 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 it's a, definitely a practice, a type of subject first, a type of subject. Um, essentially, social human interest subjects, uh, and, and when it doesn't deal uh, directly with uh, social and, and human uh, social, I mean, human uh, subject, it, for instance, animals or inanimates, it's from the perspective of the human interest. So that's fundamental. A type of approach as well, long term, in depth, long, sometimes very long period of time. That's absolutely also fundamental in the definition. And, 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 and this is what I'm not showing here. Um, and a type of uh, so in-depth coverage and a type of rendition. Uh, photographs presented as a narrative, as a story. When you talk to documentary photographers, the first thing you hear, and there might be some among you, um, it's the words, a word they use it all the time. Tell the story, telling the story, the story, the story, the narrative. First contradiction, because this is never, or very rarely, the way you see, uh, the way the general public sees documentary images. Most documentary projects are published in the form of one picture here, one picture there, piecemeal uh, uh, dissemination, couple of images here, sometimes just one image in newspapers and magazines. Very rarely, very rarely do you see the broader context in which they were produced and designed by the photographer. Except, of course, if you're a specialist, and, and I guess many of you are specialists. So I'm, I'm trying to talk about the general audience, of course, not, not us the, the, who are particularly interested in, 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 in this uh, um, topic. Um, so uh, this is what hopefully, um, I mean, this is a short definition of, of documentary photography. Uh, the documentary as such and documentary photography it, um, is in a state of crisis. Production and, at the same time, problems of, of dissemination. Um, it's, of course, uh, widely impacted by the digital revolution. Uh, it's widely impacted, broadly and deeply impacted by the, uh, the change in digital communication. Uh, in the sense that um, it's um, more and more difficult if you follow the definition in-depth coverage. In-depth coverage means that you have to spend a lot of time. And as you all know, time is money. And 
uh, and, and time being of the essence, money is also of the essence. And this is precisely what's happening in digital communication, which is just a, a sort of general expansion of a very old process. The money goes, and I'm making things as, as simple as possible, but I guess you know what I mean. The money goes, or the money, you can make money, you can live, and, and, and more than live, you can make money if you are the channel, if you're the transmitter, if you are the conduit, if you're the provider, not if you're the producer. That's the case of farmers, it's the case of photographers as well. Uh, the shift of profit and revenue from the actual producer to the, 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 the transmitters is something which has deeply impacted, deeply impacted the production of documentary photography precisely because it needs a lot of investment before you get the return on investment, if you ever do get this return on investment. So it's a, it's a very bad economic proposition uh, if you want to do in-depth coverage. Narrative, same problem. Narrative takes time. People are not interested in narrative. People want pictures. They, they want to get pictures. They want to... So, um, you know, editors will uh, only select very, very few images and, and, and re- organize them, not exactly how the photographer wants. That has always existed, but it's particularly, particularly sensitive. Now, at the same time, at the same time, um, the technical evolution, uh, uh, which has uh, given us extremely high-tech, extremely sophisticated instrument, very high-tech tools like this one, um, for the production, transmission, and dissemination of image. Um, this, these instruments have been made uh, easily available to all of us. This is the iPhone syndrome. Huh? Uh, the iPhone syndrome, which means that, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, those very sophisticated means of production, which were reserved for very skilled technicians, are now available to just about anybody. The same thing for dissemination. Uh, you, you need a very, uh, very high entrance ticket to be able to disseminate your images when now it seems to be extremely simple. So that has had a very, not simply on documentary photography, but uh, uh, I'd say that it, it, it particularly impacted uh, documentary photographers precisely because of these con constraints. Um, so the digital world is both a, an extremely um, interesting proposition, it's extremely interesting context for documentary and documentary work, and at the same time, it created, has created, a situation when economically it has become extremely difficult to produce uh, documents. A document, but not documents, but documentary projects. Um, the other thing which is connected with that and it, again, it's, it's not only impacting documentary photography, it's impacting photography in general, and more than photography. It's the dilution of authority. And by dilution of authority, I do not mean um, authority in the sense of authoritarian, um, because that has been gone for a while. Uh, <laughs> The teacher is talking here. <laughs> now, authority as author, um, the, the, what the author, the identification of an image of anything, of content with an author. Um, the, um, uh, the, 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 all this technological shift, of course, um, has led to a, a dilution of ethics, 
uh, of, of uh, um, professional practice which guaranteed authenticity. And um, as documentary photographers in particular, but that's true of journalists as well, uh, built up their reputation, built up their the right to say things and the value of what they produced on the notion of authenticity, of truth, of I'm bringing you something which I guarantee is true. Obviously, this has particularly suffered from this dilution of authority, of this broadening of access, which has meddled the concept of modeled the concept of authority. Um, and if you add to that the concept of reappropriation of content from other media uh, and from reappropriation of content published by one media reappropriated by another media and sometimes by even non-professional photographers, they call it reappropriation, you can call it reappropriation, uh, some call it aggregating, some call it enriching the content. Um, most photographers will tell you that it's, it's pure uh, stealth. It's, it's stealing content from uh, photographers and not acknowledging the copyright, not, not acknowledging the author. This dilution of authority, which is the very basis uh, of what documentary photographers had to offer. Look at the 1950s, look at the 1960s. Huh? They offered as a sort of stamp uh, their, the, what, what made their images valuable were not, was not just an aesthetic content. Oh, it's a nice picture. But it's the authenticity, which, which was fundamental. When, when you take that away, obviously, you take away also <laughs> the, um, the, the, the value of, of the document and the value of documentary photographs, which is why, and this is going to be the end, I'm already announcing the, the end of my talk, which is why uh, uh, documentary photographers are trying to reinvest authority this is one, I think, of the most promising ways of, of reinvestment, of to, to trying to, to regain this effort. The last point about the decline or, or the difficulties or the crisis of the documentary comes obviously from the end of attention. Uh, again, it's the, the, the teacher talking, and I hope you, 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 you don't suffer from that, uh, the end of attention, uh, short attention span, uh, very short time spent on any visual, not of course you because you, you are interested in, in visuals, you're interested in images, but I've done some studies on, and just, just looking at people, look at the time people spend on an image, um, just the time to like and share. Uh, circulation equals value. And I was listening to a program, I haven't read the book yet, but I think it's going to be interesting, uh, Swiss professor of literature, Vincent Kaufmann, uh, just wrote a book, Ce que les médias font à la littérature, uh, which sounds like a very interesting book. He comes to exactly the same uh, conclusion. Uh, so, images are, and, and whatever you, you may think about it, you may think about how they're used in, in publication, images, I'm sorry to say, are, are mere eye-catchers on the written page. They're not even illustrations. And I'm going to show you two, two, two just a quick selection. They're not illustration. They're less than illustration. They're just like systems, and, and I'm talking to people who are, well, some of you at least are in an art school. Uh, I suppose you've been working on layout, and, and some of you may be layout specialists. They're just elements of the layout. 
Okay. I'm showing two pictures, one from 9-11, and, and this, is the, this is the New York Times. And the New York Times is considered by photographers as one of the publications of the newspapers using photographs in a fairly intelligent way. I mean, it's not considered as, as, as a mediocre uh, medium for photographs. And if you look at these images, and this is the, well, you may have heard about this, uh, th this uh, front page was a little bit of a shock recently. Um, it's, it's known as the nipple. Uh, so it, it's not because, well, it's of course because of the Star of David, but it's the nipple, the nipple on the front page. Of, and, and basically these images are uh, uh, as, as, as well used as you can on, on a very good, um, with very intelligent people, uh, they're, just, they're just systems to draw your attention across the page. And that is all. It's not about content. It's not about the image. It's about a sort of circulation. Image, images as mere eye catcher on the written page. <coughs> And on the screen, the effect is absolutely similar, except that it's calculated in terms of seconds spent on pages before redirection, because that's what people want to know, how long you've spent on a page before uh, switching to a, another one. Um, I have not managed, and God knows I tried, I've not managed to get real figures from newspapers about their supplementary Material, the slideshows and the videos uh, that they provide. Um, I've tried to get some some um, quantitative information, and they seem to keep it as as trade secrets, which I understand. But uh, what is clear is that um, given the pressure that the New York Times, among others, uh, puts on photographers to produce those slideshow, to give them images and images and images to produce slideshows, one would think that this supplementary material has a function as an attention-catching device, but certainly not as a um, as producing elements to be read, to be read or to be uh, taken in. And I would say that the marking tools, such as the likes, are merely a, 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 an amplifier of this uh, oversimplification of appreciation. Uh, I, I like this, I, I very much like this word in the English language, art appreciation. That, that's a concept which is very difficult to translate into French. I don't think there's any very immediate translation for art appreciation. You like. You don't do art appreciation. You like. You mark. Um, and, and, and it's a very beautiful word which I think it, it, uh, uh, the, well, documentarians would like to see back in the field. Um, at the same time, you could, I was talking about uh, uh, um, the crisis of the documentary. At the same time, something interesting is happening, uh, which is the, the greater and greater demand for movie documentaries. The, the, the demand for movie documentaries is on the rise if we are to believe uh, the strategy of some of the major players in the field, if you look at Netflix and HBO, which are the, the two major um, operators on, on, on this particular segment, they produce and they buy more and more movie documentaries. So th this would seem paradoxical, in a sense. This would seem paradoxical because it would seem to say that, actually, there, there is a demand for... Uh, the documentary and that people pay attention. Well, I'm not sure that the, uh, uh, the phenomenon uh, uh, is exactly the same or should be viewed as, as an appreciation for documentary. 
I think that uh, uh, the, the, this, uh, because that, that's an objection that sometimes people make, that, well, yeah, but look, look at all the documentaries and, and all the festivals uh, going on. And, 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 yes, documentaries available on, um, on Netflix and HBO. Well, uh, first, I'm, I'm not sure if you've watched some of these documentaries. They're not a very good quality, most of them not. Uh, many are on, on topics that are uh, dubious to say the least. Um, sex and war, basically. Um, and, well, dubious. It's not dubious. Dubious, I mean, in terms of attraction. You're trying to uh, show things that might attract viewers. But I think that it should be seen as, as parallel, as just like the demand for fiction movies based on a true story as it were, uh, or, or f series uh, based on documentary research. And I have the impression that it's not, uh, when, when, when there's this demand, this urge for uh, documentaries, movie documentaries, I think it's not so much uh, uh, a demand for perhaps deep understanding or reality itself, but much more for precisely a tourist vision of the world, the sort of uh, authenticity without the hassle. That's a hypothesis, but um, I, I, I think I, I can justify it. Okay. Um, so... Um, uh, on the one hand, you've got this crisis of uh, the documentary, uh, most difficult to uh, uh, most difficult to um, still make those documentaries, and on the other hand, uh, you have evidence of the what I call the documentary impulse. Documentaries are still being made, and more and more of them. Um, that is perhaps for a, a reason which uh, I will not uh, develop unless there are questions and, and we, we can get into it. Um, um, in particular, I think one of the reasons for uh, this, uh, the fact that all those people, uh, all those photographers uh, do want to do documentary. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons is that they believe, they still believe, they believe, and despite evidence to the contrary, that images have an impact on society. Uh, images can change the world. Images can improve the way we live. If you talk to documentary photographers, this is one of the first things they will say. They say, well, my images will make a difference. If you keep talking with them, especially war photographers, people who are in sort of extreme situation, perhaps more than people doing like very standard documentary, if you keep talking to them, and I've done a whole bunch of long interviews, like an hour and a half, and a half talking to them, they eventually say, well, well, no, no. I know that my images won't change anything. So why do you do it? Well, do it because, 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 okay, let have them talk. So th those are just um, a few uh, excerpts from um, some documentary photographers, mostly unknown, uh, that I've worked on. Uh, I've, I've just taken this from their websites. And I think it's, it's quite interesting to see uh, the aim of photography is to bring awareness to the masses of those suffering most, often completely unseen by the majority. Chris believes that there is a redemptive quality to photography. Huh? Amazing. 
that it can take the unpleasant and make it beautiful. It's, it's, it's extremely uh, new age huh? kind of thing. Uh, I have some, some even more new age quotes. Um, uh, and I think that the, the last uh, part is quite interesting. Well, he, he, he calls himself, uh, I think it's an himself. It's a Chris, it's a, I think it's a Chris man. Uh, as a first photo, well, yeah, his method. Uh, as as a photojournalist, his method of making pictures. Now, of course, that's written by himself. Huh? Um, as a photojournalist, his method uh, of making pictures is not something new or incredibly deep. Uh, of course, fishing for compliments. Uh, it's simply to tell the truth, uh, which to me is is a very <laughs> problematic concept. Uh, simply to tell the truth. Um, when not being commissioned to create, Andy is immersed in personal uh, photographic project, regular yoga practice, yeah, telling you about new age, and the company of others, etc., etc. So, um, now, this could appear as such, could, could appear as laughable, but I, I want to stress that all the photographers I worked with, I should say on, because I'm sort of studying them, um, are people who have an extraordinary commitment, amazing commitment, irrespective of their extremely hard economic difficulties. They bear some immense difficulties. They don't make money. They Very often they live really from hand to mouth. They have very difficult lives. Uh, most of them could have had a different career. Uh, they, well, sometimes and that sort of helps. They come from privileged backgrounds. That helps. Um, there's a bit of money in the family. Uh, but many went to excellent universities. They could have been just about anything and just decided not to make money but do this. So when people are so committed, you, that, that sort of questions you. Huh? When, when it's not just because I mean people who do like corporate people who do uh, fashion you say okay they want the girls the money the... yeah of course but uh, no that's not the case here you you only have problems <laughs> you only have problems and 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 whereas your life could have been different and if it's the kind of documentary done on drugs on uh, the Mexico, uh, 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 U.S.-Mexico border or war, it's your life and your limbs uh, uh, that you can lose. So uh, there must be something. <laughs> there must be something. Uh, it, it's not just... Uh, uh, but, and, and this is something I think is a genuine concern, uh, this it's a choice of lifestyle, I should say. It's a choice. It's a choice because none of them were, were sort of... I followed a series of, of, of uh, a career path and, and none of them were pressured to do that. None of them did that because they couldn't do anything else. Uh, there are lots of things they could... And, and really, they could have gone into much more economically rewarding careers. So this choice of lifestyle is first and foremost, uh, I think, um, uh, built on a genuine concern for others, a form of curiosity for the world, and a need to share this fascination for otherness, for other people, even though sometimes the people are close to home, and um, do something which is as basic as enlarging, believing that they can enlarge other people's existence, they can enlarge other people's scope uh, uh, and worldview. 
which is. Um, as I said, the, the, uh, uh, it's a, sometimes a belief in the possibility to change things, and very often, obviously, they pair economically with NGOs, for instance, huh? because NGOs need pictures, and they believe that by working for certain NGOs, they can fight for the causes they document. And many, in fact, who do not find the right NGOs also create, and we'll see a couple of them later on, uh, they create their own uh, sort of little NGO, little operation on their favorite topic and try to raise people's consciousness. Uh, Perhaps that, well, okay, we'll, we'll see it in, in, in one of the slides. Um, they is also, and that shouldn't be, uh, that shouldn't be uh, played down, there is also, to a certain extent, a fascination for a lifestyle which will take them into adventurous situation, uh, a sense of adventure, the sense that Documentary photography and just like being a, a journalist uh, um, is something that will take you to uh, to the to, to, to places that you can't even dream of. So the sense of adventure. There's also an internal reason. There's also an internal reason uh, for photographers to do documentary. And here it's, of course, a, a totally a ridiculously short, limited, biased uh, uh, selection of masters of documentary photography. There's a form of internal reason. Because photo for photographers, doing documentary is perhaps the most aristocratic activity. The most aristocratic activity, it's what you can do when you've made it. You're, you're just king of the, king of the world. Uh, because for them, it's the most enduring type of coverage. It stays. And this is the model that has defined the great figures of the past, such as people like Eugene Smith. Well, this is from a country doctor, but he did. Smith is, is probably the ultimate example of the dedicated documentary photographer. Uh, who else do I have? Danny Lyon with the bikers, one example. Could have chosen 20 others. Larry Clark with Tulsa uh, and various other projects. And Philip Jones Griffith with uh, Vietnam Incorporated. By the way, Philip Jones Griffith was, in fact, part of Magnum, uh, Magnum Cooperative. Why was Magnum created? Magnum was created precisely to allow well, those who considered themselves as the best photographers of the time to conduct those uh, um, projects. Uh, conduct those very long-term projects. So this is still very strong in the imagination, in the imaginary of those photographers. Uh, this is what, and this time I'm going to use a word which has, which is difficult to translate into English, which is, I think, much better in French. It's it's le grand reportage. Grand reportage is what journalists aspire to. They, they want to become this grand reporter, huh? the long-term in-depth dive into a situation which leads to feature-length reportage, whether in text or in images. So I believe that there's also this internal reason why they, uh, doc documentarians, uh, keep doing documentary precisely because it's the ultimate. So faced with that, uh, what do they do? 
um, well, most documentary photographers have faced with this crisis of attention, faced with the crisis, economic crisis of production, no money to make it. Uh, they have definitely chosen, and I think that's the most interesting thing which is happening at the moment, they have chosen, they have shifting their positioning towards authorship. They've decided that they shouldn't be mere recorders, however gifted, skillful, competent, but real thinking subject, expressing an original point of view, a personality, feeling. Uh, in fact, claiming a place which had been denied to them. Um, for a long time, they were considered like second-class journalists. Uh, um, so this is something that they have definitely chosen, and, and I think it's the right track. They've decided to reclaim this authorship. Also, they've decided that what they do is for memory the recording for posterity, something that is not for today. I'm a documentarian, not for my contemporaries, not for you guys, but because I'm thinking in much longer term. I'm, I'm building for the future, even though you might not see my pictures, you might not see enough of my pictures, but what I do, I have to do it for the future and for the whole of humanity. So this idea of memory building, of recording for posterity, which can be done through NGOs, foundation, grants, this is why they, they, manage to, they manage to get some economic support precisely through this memory aspect uh, from NGOs, from uh, great Amer large American foundations and, and various public or private grants, not the market. Of course, the market doesn't support that. The market uh, supports the, the, the present. That is not without raising a lot of questions. A lot of questions. There are technical questions about this. Huh? Permanence. Well, Anne Cartier-Bresson was here talking about. <laughs> uh, so permanence, uh, digital image, images, ac and, 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 and uh, also access to archives. Access to archives, which is something that uh, we are now experiencing, because as you know, most major archives uh, were bought by Corbis and Getty, and now into private hands. Uh, and uh, as you may know, photo archives are the major cash cow for photo agencies. Magnum makes much of its revenue from its archives, uh, not from <laughs> what it's producing now. So access to these archives is something which, and, and all these archives collected by all those photographers uh, are in danger of either being lost or being confiscated by um, operators. And they've chosen uh, a variety of uh, 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 media to uh, carry their images. So I'm now going to go through these. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, different ones. Many, many of them you know. Uh, I just want to refresh your memory. Um, if the if the PowerPoint is online, is put online, you can there there are connection links uh, uh, to uh, the. Okay, the first one is the book. Two types of books. The book. The the book is back. Uh, the book. The the photo book is back. I'm not sure it's again for the general public, but. It does have a, a form of impact. The informative book, I've chosen, well, most of the, 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 the names I've chosen here are people I, I've worked on. So Robert Nicholsberg, time photographer, who did this very, very interesting book on Afghanistan. Uh, Donna Ferrato, which 
some of you may know, Living with the Enemy, uh, it's about violence, uh, 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 domestic violence against women. It's mostly women beaten by their... Uh, uh, and, and she lived for years with, with uh, uh, various women who even, I mean, doing pictures in very, really embedded, pass me the expression, uh, but it's interesting to see Afghanistan on one side and, and living with the enemy. It's a wonderful uh, work, very, very intense work on, on domestic violence. She produced a book, and this is the inside of the book, see, pictures, but also a lot of text, of text explaining the context. Um, so bringing in information, which on the whole the information, the, 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 the pictures can bring, but not enough. And also uh, books of a more reflexive kind. Uh, I've chosen this Looking for Marshall McLuhan in Afghanistan by person, a uh, Canadian photographer called Rita Leitzner. Uh, uh, it's a book I like very much. It, I also happen to have translated it into French. So, uh, But it's, it's, what it is is that she chose with, with other photographers to go to Afghanistan with an iPhone, period, and do everything with an iPhone, um, and use all the possibilities of the social networks to... Uh, interact with the soldiers and soldiers' families back home. And apart from that, she also did a book on th how we could rethink Marshall McLuhan today with our new technology. Is Marshall McLuhan still interesting for us to understand uh, what we do when we do documentary and when we do photography? So this is one example. Other books, uh, what I call the oblique kind. So these are two books by Peter van Achtmel, who is a uh, Peter van Achtmel is a member of, of uh, Magnum, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you can't really see. This is called Disco Night 9/11. Uh, it's about the United States around 9/11. And if you click um, on, on this, you can get, you can view inside in, in, in Amazon. And he's just published this buzzing at the seal, which is uh, looking at the United States, but today. But it's not exactly, uh, it's oblique in the sense that it's a portrait of the United States, which is not exactly like Robert Franks, the American, but at the same time, it's, it's not just one person followed for a long time, but it's various aspect of how he sees, as a, also a war photographer, how he sees his society impacted by these constant wars. The fact that the United States is a country at war, which has been at war for years and years and years. And, and what this does to his own society. So, well, I call it oblique in the sense that it's not Again, one topic like Donna Ferrato uh, doing, living with the enemy, doing something on a very specific topic. Beyond the book, this is Tom Hetherington, who died in Libya, who was killed in Libya. Uh, this is, is, is done by his uh, friends, the Trust. Uh, why I call it Beyond the Book? Because if you go to the site, you will see also uh, the, the, that Tom, Tim before dying, uh, I mean, not before dying, because he didn't know he would, uh, but uh, uh, when he was active in, 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 in war, in the various uh, war theaters, uh, thought that he could not actually render what the war was by just war pictures. So he did this very, very interesting... Uh, if you click on this, you'll get to uh, the, to, uh, I don't know if it's Vimeo, 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 I mean, whatever. Uh, you will get, you, you can see a uh, diary. And this is attempt, this is an attempt. And diary is, in fact, about flowers and war and getting drunk and me and war. So very much involved as a person. 
Uh, well, the, 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 the book is called Object. It's the the uh, Yale University has a project which is to collect all these books. Huh? Um, and of course, the sites. This is good friend Louis Palu, uh, Canadian, extremely gifted uh, Canadian documentarian. And if you go to their, uh, this is typical of most of their uh, site, you have this image which you have a flipping, uh, changing image, and you have uh, a, a series of, of uh, uh, reportage that you can visit, you can look at, you can um, uh, hopefully enjoy in, at length. And uh, e uh, eventually, and, and this is just a series of just, just a series of links. Uh, Alex South, uh, it, it rhymes with both, uh, as he says. Uh, Alex South, uh, Magnum, uh, John Lowenstein, Beth Edwards, Magdabina, and Chris Sims, uh, that I chose just randomly. Um, all these people have uh, websites where they um, develop story in a much more artistic, uh, fine arts mood. Alex Soth does um, standard documentary, but at the same time, he produces a lot of fine arts lot, and, and makes a lot of money, by the way, by all his fine arts, uh, 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 all his fine arts work, but trying to expand the experience of uh, documenting his um, his subjects. So we don't really have time to go into them, but uh, you may just go and look. And and this is definitely, I think, one way of claiming back the authorship and saying that. It's not just showing things. It's also trying to take you into a world. And this will be my, sorry, my conclusion in a few seconds because this is the more classic social documentary project. You may, you may have seen the exhibition. It came to Paris. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still on. It came to La Grande Arche, uh, where there's the uh, Too Young to Wed, by Stephanie Sinclair of Seven Photo Agency, who set up this uh, 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 set up a, 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 an organization to help young women not to get married in a variety of countries that she documented, help put them through school and sometimes university. So, too young to wed is is of course. Uh, children uh, uh, brides. And you see here, explore, look at the video, take action, donate, etc. Uh, so get involved, just like a regular NGO. Here it's facing change. It's a bunch of photographers uh, documenting present-day America, especially they've just finished a major work on Detroit where they don't only take pictures of Detroit, but they train people, train students, uh, train younger people to take pictures, to become editors, etc. There's an incredible work also done, I haven't put it here, but by uh, the Bronx Documentary Center, uh, uh, which uh, does uh, a lot of community work around photography, both uh, uh, doing, showing, exhibiting photographs and at the same time training the local kids to become exhibitors and photographers for some of them and etc. And uh, what is it? Oh, this is of course Susan Maizelas uh, who will be a major retrospective at the Jeu de Boom uh, soon. Uh, Maizelas uh, who uh, is not only a one of the major now 
uh, Magnum photographers, but uh, see, that's her work on Nicaragua. She did, she did in 1978, and which she, she went back to Nicaragua and shows and places the pictures where she uh, took them and involves the population. And here, Kurdistan in the shadow of history where she works on collecting, helping Kurds to collect their memory. So you see, um, here it's getting involved. It's, it's doing something which has a very definite documentary value, a very definite artistic value, but also a community value. Huh? Trying to combine the two and, say, and not saying that they are opposite and that they can be, um, they can be uh, uh, brought together and they can be brought together especially by those new technologies. Now, do people see it? Do people watch it? It's a little bit more complicated than that. I think that uh, the best work that documentary photographers do is when they get closest to the communities, when they, and they do a lot of that. Either the communities that they photograph, so returning the images, or other communities, involving other communities, coming to a particular a, a place and, and, and working with students, working with schools, and showing their pictures and, and teaching the, the, the children, and, and many of them do that, to appreciate. Documentary, not necessarily art, but documentary, the documentary. So as a conclusion, one should not try to be too prescriptive, because prescriptors are always wrong. Uh, yet I think that one can at least formulate one or two wishes. The first one is that, uh, however ineffective to change the world, the role of witness is essential in the long term for the health of our societies. Uh, the only danger is that, and this is the big danger, the only danger is that we think that being a, that when there is a witness, that's enough. I saw it, I recorded it, good enough, end of story. Well, unfortunately, we know that uh, that doesn't work this way. Uh, if we don't do things, uh, things will not change. But... Uh, it's certainly necessary for the health of our societies. The second one, the second wish I would make, is that this avenue that those younger, docu younger or not so young, uh, documentary uh, 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 photographers pursue will, uh, hopefully it will bear fruit. Um, to, to make a comparison, I, th I think that the f that. Uh, uh, the documentary uh, in photography, the documentary has the potential to do a little bit what literature does. Literature draws readers into another world than their own. I believe that the most important thing is that literature does is that it gets you outside of you. Uh, I sometimes read for confirmation, as we all do, but it's when you get outside of your little self uh, through literature. And I think that the documentary f uh, has this potential much more than other forms of uh, photography or even art. Uh, although we know that literature does not change the world, and we know that it's totally unreasonable to think that uh, photographs uh, could do it, um, in, um, or do more than just informing a little bit uh, um, about the world. There remains one function for documentary photography, uh, and that is by catching us as close as possible to our common humanity. Documentary photography challenges us in our comfort, certitudes, familiarity. I agree 
it's not enough, but it's already quite something. Thank you. Um, pre precisely, uh, okay, um, precisely in uh, not pretending that the, the image uh, or the images, because once again uh, we're talking about the, but the, the image is either the truth of the world, uh, on the world, or it's, it's what is out there. Uh, the crisis of authority, basically the idea that images uh, uh, lie, or, I mean lie, images are not the world. I, in a way, I think that the crisis of authority that you're talking about it, it is a good thing uh, because um, the, the, the transparency of images is, is probably the greatest danger that there exists. Uh, so what they what you do what they do, and you could take these all, all these uh, as uh, examples, is that I think they reinvest the documentary with the codes of art and say that it's my view of the world. I'm not telling you the truth about the world. I'm telling you how I feel as a person. Diary by uh, uh, Tim Hetherington, and God knows that Tim was someone. Tim Hetherington was someone who was extremely involved in 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 trying to change the world. Uh, he spent an enormous amount of time in Africa, uh, uh, trying to uh, not t necessarily taking pictures, but really working with people. But he believed that. Uh, it's regaining authority by reconstruct by, by establishing the precisely the subjectivity of the subject. So I'm I'm not. Uh, this is what they're saying. I'm not telling you the truth about the world because you know that images lie. That we're all liars. That you get no. I'm telling you about myself. I'm drawing you into my world. And hopefully, by, it's just like literature. Literature is not about, even if it's realistic literature, it's not, it's not, it's authorship and uh, not the truth about the world. So, so that's, that's, I think, this is why I insisted on fine arts, the, 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 all the codes of fine arts. And, and the fact, what's interesting is that the same people will do, like, hot news, because, of course, one has to, pay the bills, huh? uh, so hot news, but use some of these images transformed into uh, a series uh, uh, for the New York Times magazine where you can have like four or five images, six, seven, eight sometimes, and then use the same images and, and, and add other ones into a completely personal exhibition or a completely personal book. So I'm taking you into my world and, and I'm I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I've been there trying to transmit some of this impression. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Can't imagine. Uh, some of you, question. maybe some of you <laughs> are documentary photographers or want to be documentary photographers. the 
students in the room? Any questions? Maybe not necessarily about this talk. But no, no, I mean, you can... photography? So um, you mentioned a lot about the narrative aspect of documentary, and I guess you know, that I'm very interested in that part of photography in the whole like fabricating of the moment. But as to as a traditional documentary photographer, um, what are the exact key elements that should compose that photograph to make it a true narrative-based photograph? <coughs> the answer is it should not be a photograph. <laughs> There's no such thing as, well, uh, I think it's an excellent question because we keep saying the documentary photograph. This is why I say that uh, the, I don't think there's really a documentary style. Uh, uh, aesthetically uh, uh, a photograph is not documentary a photograph is something uh, to, to have a uh, a documentary I mean documentary are projects they're, they're complex projects and they are more and more multimedia. I mean, they've always been multimedia, in the sense that, and this is something that we all know, but we always forget that we never, never, ever see images alone. We always see images with text, at least, or context. Images alone don't exist, and they don't exist in a vacuum. Now, your question. Uh, I think really raises an excellent point, which is that there, there is no such thing as a documentary photograph. Documentary is a project first, so it's production, it's a project, and then gets rendered into complex forms. Uh, sometimes it's a series of images with text, uh, various types of text, mixing various types of images, images of the topic and images that can be different but reinforce the topic, now mixing video installation, and this is why I was talking about art, uh, using all the, all the tools of, of art, the fine art, in order to, but serving even though you may talk about yourself, you're serving, at some point, the problem is to serve the topic. Uh, domestic violence, uh, 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 young brides, uh, HIV, drugs, uh, the Mexico border, uh, whatever, uh, or, or uh, climate change. I mean, anything. Uh, it's yes, I'm talking about myself, but I'm not talking about myself because you know I'm a, such an interesting person. I'm talking about myself because I'm a person in a situation, and I felt this, and I feel this, and and you know I'm really war. Really is an experience, and and but it's war. It's the war that the United States are fighting. I, I, I've been I've been working on on American photographers. That's why I'm saying, but that. The West is fighting, but it's me in the war. But it's not me who is interesting. It's him. So, uh, yes, good point, because sometimes we say documentary photograph. No, there's no such thing. Ah, at least I believe right? that there's no such thing as a documentary. Uh, documentary. Uh, not really a question, it's more comment about uh, what you say about the, the kind of democratization of you know, the new technology, mm -hmm. uh, which I also I do not hate because I grew up with all these all this objects. And now, uh, so everybody can use it. It's 
not, uh, so it's, it kills in some how the kind of aristocracy who has the power of using <coughs> the images. Um, and so I start to like it. Of course, it's not as democratic, but it's still expensive. But it's easy to, it's like, yes. but it's easy to use it. So it's, uh, because documentary is also, I'm not, uh, I'm not making documentary, but as you say, documentary is how to show the unseen. Mm. Uh, so it's also like this kind of democratization of the objects, of course, of course low down the quality, but uh, it goes in the same way to show the unseen means to give power to everybody and people who are also out of the, mm. of the light mm -hmm. to express their point of view. So I don't know if you have Yes, uh, of course. And, and um, I mean, there, there are two answers to your question. Uh, one is, and, and, and of course this raises a lot of issues, huh? uh, and, and I, I, I agree with you, it raises a lot of issues. Uh, the, the, the democratization, and when I say democratization, I mean uh, it's not simply a question of money, because, I mean, yes, equipment can be expensive, but uh, you can do incredible things with not extremely expensive equipment. It's the it's not so much this as the skill. Uh, you don't need... A, it's just like skiing today. I mean, with the kind of skis and, and ski boots you have, anybody can be you know, pretty efficient, which they could not 40 years ago with the equipment there was. Technique was so important. And you see a lot, a lot, a lot of younger photographers are people who are completely self-trained, and self-trained in a very simple way. They, oh, I was interested in pictures, so I bought a camera and I started taking pictures, which is something that you couldn't do uh, like 80 years ago. <laughs> so, yes, there is this, this access, this access, and there is also the access of, and this is quite important, it's known as citizen journalist, etc., but the access of certain people uh, uh, who are not professional image makers, but who can bring in uh, images. Now, of course, the, uh, they will bring completely different images. Huh? And, and yes, uh, um, uh, you, you completely change the, the meaning and the form of images. Huh? Uh, I completely agree uh, there. Thank you very much. I know that you have a I have a train to catch. Unfortunately, I teach at 8 tomorrow morning in Lyon, so I have to catch the, the last train. <laughs> I'm sorry. I won't be able to uh, see the, the image, the, the very interesting uh, 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 movies or, or uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.